Topo Athletic is committed to lifelong health and better movement. Topo builds running shoes for those who get out there every day, regardless of weather, speed, energy, or mood. Their distinctive fit and feel combines instinctive human movement with modern performance and lightweight comfort to help you keep going, keep trying, and keep moving. Discover the Topo difference and step into a run experience unlike any other. Hey everybody, welcome to our fireside chat. I think we're at 72 at this point, which is bananas to me. But today we have a very special guest. His name is Michael Silva. He's from My Run Strong. Um, Michael is help, has been helping runners for the past 20 years in helping them to run faster, run longer, and most importantly, without pain, which we can all agree is very important. Know about one of his goals. One of Michael's goals is to help a million runners. And when you think about it, there are 50 million runners in the U.S. So, you know, a million might seem like a lot, but at the same time, it's kind of small, right? So we're really excited to have Michael join us, uh, who, perfect timing, as he joins us right now. Uh, is that a drum set in the background? Oh, no, that's like a weight machine in the background. I thought it was a drum set, too, for a minute there. <laughs> you know what's funny is that I am a drummer, but that's from the other part of the house. <laughs> oh, we, so we got it anyways. I could have uh, been, like, twirling drumsticks. That would have been perfect. <laughs> How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. It's been been some time since you and I chatted, um, and, and you did write an article for us on the website. For anybody who needs, go to runtrymag.com, click articles, run. You'll see Michael's story there. Um, and so we just wanted, wanted you to come on and talk to us a little bit because I was really enamored with your story of how you're looking to help runners uh, and then honestly shocked at the idea of helping a million runners, right? Like that's that seems like a ton of people, but, you know, right. based on I think it's pretty uh, evident that you have the ability and the, the want to, the drive to, to help a million runners. Or the craziness. I'm not sure which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a number I threw out there. You know, you got to aim big, see what happens. That's awesome. <laughs> but hey, we have a very special question before we get started because it kind of determines who's going to handle the uh, Q&A portion of the interview. Is that okay? That's fine. So pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Just Sorry. All right. I'll be taking over from here then. <laughs> Bye, Jason. Have a good Are day. you in Connecticut, dude? I'm in uh, Rhode Island. Oh, Rhode Island. <laughs> Northeasterners don't eat pineapple on pizza. I put grilled pineapple on everything. <laughs> I freaking love grilled pineapple. <laughs> I just made a summer corn salad with black beans and grilled pineapple and jalapenos, and it was awesome. Ooh, ooh that's my favorite. Right? Pineapple on pizza uh, by itself, or do you have to add a, another product to it? Well, typically when you get it, it's the Hawaiian pizza and there's some sort of like ham or brujute or something. Yeah. So whatever comes with it. See, but that's you. Now that now you prove my point. Like nobody has ever said I really like just pineapple on pizza. It's always like I gotta have ham and I gotta have jalapenos. Right, I... right, 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 right. All right. So you're back on now. You're you're doing the Q and A. I agree with you now. I've never made so I've, I've made a lot of pizza. I've never put pineapple on my own pizza. If I'm out and I'm in the mood for it, I'll eat it and I, I love it. But so answer, take that answer however you guys want. Do what you want with it. <laughs> this, this is why our Food Fight Friday is super popular, by the way, because people feel strongly about their uh, food takes. But then you right. add like, a little component to it, and it changes everything. It's hilarious. Right, so food, politics, and orthotics are like hot, <laughs> hot yeah, they're <laughs> controversial items. <laughs> I love it. Well, speaking of orthotics, let's get into who you are and what you're doing. And, and I'm going to read to you uh, what Breathing Smiles 47 wrote, which is aim small, miss small. One million is perfect. So it goes to your let's help a million runners. So what is it exactly that are you that you're looking to help runners do? So I'm looking to help runners run um we all know probably the number one thing that keeps a runner from running is injury right. and i've spent 20 almost 25 years as a physical therapist um, rehabbing runners and trying to keep them healthy doing that all within the the confines of the insurance regulated medical system that we have which can be tough to do to work with runners and you know try to get coverage to that so i did that for many years built a pretty successful practice i sold that 
And now what I'm trying to do is help runners through more preventative self-care, wellness focused, full whole, whole health approach to the runner. We're talking mind, body, um, nutrition, mental health, everything that you can um, imagine that would help or hinder a runner. Um, and I'm trying to do that through, I, I speak all over the country um, from college age kids up to professionals and big conferences. So my million is not me actually one-on-one -on -one with a million people because I don't know if I have enough years left in my lifetime to do that. Um, but just you know, through the public speaking and everything else and through online, even here, however many runners or triathletes show up, we're going to add that to the list and see how close we can get. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely make sure we get you a good number on, on okay. that. We'll add you said we're going to get about a half a million tonight. Yeah, at least. At least a half a million. Awesome. <laughs> we're going to have to move your number to 1.5 million oh. then. <laughs> got to keep we got to keep stretching ourselves so right. when you're you know so if you think about this right so so running is is physical right and so i'm imagining helping runners and i'm putting that in air quotes for those of you listening on the podcast but if you're at conference how are you helping them on the physical side of running is it are you using um you know models or are you showing them videos like what does that process look like yeah, depending on the venue. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times it's like a like a, a PowerPoint keynote presentation where I'm discussing different aspects of I call foundational health. Um, I think that's I think that was similar to the article I might have shared with you guys. Yeah. But I did write an article for a local medical journal on how um, working on foundational health for endurance athletes, mainly runners, but all endurance athletes, could be the key to running success and longevity. Um, and those involve things like. Um, getting proper sleep, hydration, proper tissue preparation for your running, proper dynamic warm up, stretching, strengthening, smart training, appropriate rest and recovery, all those things go into it. So when I'm in, presenting in front of a group, it's either on one aspect or touching on all of those topics and giving, you know, I hate using the word hacks or quick tips, but like little things that people might not know and how to get a, how to, you know, set yourself up for success to get a good night's sleep or how to recover properly or how to properly use a foam roller or a massage gun, things like that. Um, so it could be me just standing up there talking and giving information. I'm actually going to be doing uh, an event coming up in Boston where I'm going to be running five clinics in two days within a big conference. And we're actually going to get there and do um, mobility and strength and exercises geared specifically to runners. So we'll get them in there and actually doing the work with us. That's pretty cool. Before I ask you the next question, for those of you who are just joining us, we're talking with from My Run Strong, and his goal is to help a million runners, um, which may seem like a lot, but out of 50 million runners in the U.S., it really isn't that much. If you have a question for Michael, you can type it into the little comment box down there or use a little question mark at the bottom of the screen to, to ask him a question. And so the, the, the question I'm going to ask you next is, why should I listen to Michael Silva? And the reason why I phrase it that way is because if you're telling me about nutrition, hydration, sleep, you know, all of these, couldn't I just Google this stuff and get information? Why is it, why is it that coming from you is going to be more important, impactful, helpful than if I do it that way? It's a really good question. So if you want right now, if your laptop's in front of you, I want you to Google something like running injuries, right? And last time I Googled it, it was 305 million hits. So Good luck weeding through all of that, right? Um, you know, and as you guys can see, I've got great hair. I've been doing this for a pretty long time. So um, I don't know how many thousands of runners already that I've helped, but um, nothing beats sound advice that from someone who's, you know, made a bunch of mistakes on people in the past. Um, I've hopefully not hurt any runners, but, you know, through successes and not so successful interactions with these runners, I've figured out um, what works and what doesn't work. And my goal is to impart the successful stuff onto the people I work with. So I know certain things, advice I may have given 20 years ago when I was a young cowboy PT thinking I could cure everyone might not be the same advice I give now. So I think it's just through the sheer experience and not many PTs um, have a focus where they've worked with runners probably as much as um, I have. But for the most part of my career, at least for the past 15 years, I would say 85 to 90% of my clientele have been runners of all different levels from, you know, freshmen in high school, age groupers to Olympic professional athletes. So you learn a lot after, you know, thousands of patients and many years of doing it. So I would hope to impart some of that knowledge and wisdom um, in the advice and the um, guidance that I'm giving. Uh, 
And we actually have uh, a question here from Breathing Miles 47 talking about like information. Uh, mm -hmm. They're mentioning talking about the psoas muscle. There's a lot of contradictory info out there and I've been struggling. And the reason I'm bringing that up um, is it's kind of a two-parter. I would like you to kind of answer that. But also the question came up to me when you talked about doing this for a long time. Uh, when we talked to our last guest on the show or our second to last guest, uh, we talked about fitness influencers and kind of the age of social media and how there's a lot of information out there in the air. And a lot of people are putting details out there without necessarily having the right credentials. Um, so you've been in this industry for a while now and you've probably seen that change happen. So I guess the two-parter is talking about the contradictory info, the Pessoa's muscle, but also talking about all the contradictory info that's just out there right. um, and how you navigate that as a professional who's been doing this for a long time. Um, all right, so first I'll say, just so you don't say it wrong again, the P is silent. It's not like the P in pineapple. It's a psoas muscle. Psoas, that's good. <laughs> yes. I used to say, uh, that's because I used to say Pusuedo all the time <laughs> instead of <"Pusuedo."> right, right. <laughs> That's a common mistake for me. Yeah, no, that's what everyone does it. Um, so I'll start there real quick. So the psoas muscle is an extremely important muscle with runners, an extremely important muscle um, with all humans because I think all of us right now are sitting and we probably have sat probably more of our day today than on any of us wanted to. So with prolonged sitting that unfortunately most humans are doing between commuting um, and their jobs sitting in front of screens all the time, the, you can develop um, not only tightness in the hip flexor, but weakness. So I'm not sure where they're talking about the controversy, but what I've seen is that you know, everyone wants to stretch the psoas, which is important because it gets tight, especially with prolonged sitting, like we just mentioned, but also repeated activity. So think about a marathon runner who's on their, you know, 80, 90 mile weeks. And they're really high mileage runners and they're an accountant during the day. They have a two hour commute in and out of the city and then they're putting on 80 miles. Like that psoas muscle is gonna take a beating between the prolonged sitting and then the activity. So not only do we need to stretch the psoas, but a lot of people forget to strengthen it. So strengthening exercises are just as important, depending on the person, sometimes more, sometimes less than just stretching it. And I think that could be where some of the controversy lies. Um, but I tell you for any um, client that I've worked with, whether they were an endurance athlete or not, that has had like chronic low back pain, 80% of the time, so as muscles involved to one extent or another, whether it's overactive and yanking on the spine or it's too tight and yanking on the spine or it's too weak and not providing any uh, pelvic and hip stability. So I hope that answers the question about the uh, psoas muscle. <laughs> so for a guy like Mike, uh, works in marketing, doesn't own a car and doesn't run 80 to 90 mile weeks, even though I'm running 100 milers, I'm, I typically don't go above like 50 miles in a week. Um, right. I should be okay. Well, if you're, you, again, you're getting a lot of places by walking, yeah. I'm assuming you have a walkable city. That's perfect. Yeah. I actually just put, I actually just put a post on my um, social media today about going for a walk. Fortunately, we have technology like cars, right? So, and it's become the go-to whenever you have to go anywhere, you jump in the car. Like this, the market is not even a half a mile from my house. Yeah. So I, li I literally walked there, pick up some groceries, had like 10 pounds of groceries. And I walked back. It was a beautiful day. And then one of my neighbors came by and he's like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm just going to the market. He's like, you need a ride? I'm like, no. He's like, you're walking? I'm like, yeah. He's like, why? I'm like, because I can. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. So, I, just, I had a conversation with a, with a friend of mine the other day because he posted, he, he ran for the year, you know, whatever the number was, 2,000 miles. I don't, I don't even remember. But I went and looked back at my steps for the year. And when I divided my steps by 2,000, which is about what it takes for me to run a mile, I was close to like, 1800 1900 and it made me think to myself which is better right and, and 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 i think it's splitting hairs right now you have to have running volume specificity of course to, mm -hmm. to run. but in terms of overall fitness right could he he's super fast right he's one of those guys that runs 17 minute 5k's right 16 minute 5k right. like i'm never get there even in a car but <laughs> can he run 100, 100 miles Right. And the answer mm -hmm. is no, that's not his thing. And so right. I started like all the walking that I do, plus the 35 to 45 miles a week, like, does that help me get into that shape, that fitness shape to complete 50 
to a hundred mile race. You know, I think it's, I think it's definitely doing something to help you because of, if you ever heard the term time on foot, yeah. Yeah. so you, you have a lot of time on foot. So you're every step you take, you, you're strengthening bones, you're strengthening your plantar fascia, you're strengthening ligaments and tendons and cartilage. That's only going to make you more resilient when you get into the training. Now, walking is not going to get you to your PR next ultra that you're going to do, but it might make you resilient enough that the training you do need to put in to get to that level of, of athleticism might not be an injury waiting to happen for you. And here's what's interesting. So I'm in a really hilly city, and so when we're talking about running up and down uh, the trails on mountains, right, hiking and stuff like that, like I have felt and my hiking ability has vastly improved because of the walking around the city. And to your point, the story you just mentioned about the 10 pounds of groceries, right? right. So when I park it, I'm picking that up and I got to walk uphill, not to sound like my parents. I walked uphill both ways, both ways. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I got to walk back uphill from the grocery store with a sack full of groceries, five, 10 pounds, right. you know, of extra weight and climbing back up. And it, it really is kind of thing that without super run specificity for the, those, that type of racing at this point, I've seen my improvement on that trail because I go to the same one every weekend to compare myself, right? right? Yeah. What am I doing? Right. And I've seen it improve. And so it's pretty interesting to see how that all ties in together and hopefully prevents injury. It's not 100% foolproof though, right? No, but it's not going to hurt. It's only going to build your resiliency. Have you guys ever heard of the, the, the Blue Zones? Yeah. Yeah, there's a, new, there's a Netflix documentary. Have you have you seen it? Watch it. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've done a lot of reading on it. My my wife is also in the field and studied it pretty intensely. But one thing they all have in common is they walk, and a lot of them have really hilly, like the Sardinia, Italy. It's a it's like a vertical city. So these 70, 80 gardening, carrying their own groceries, and there's something to it for longevity. Again, it builds resilience. Um, I think it does other mental and emotional benefits too just by getting out there in nature and walking and not being stuck in a car in traffic yeah. um but yeah i think the resiliency on all aspects of health that it's providing is probably the benefits that you're seeing and i think it will never do anyone harm um to get walking a little more so we're moving to loma linda soon yes. enough <laughs> <laughs> those people are amazing though aren't they it's amazing so i think it's i think it's loma linda california there is sardinia italy there's a place in Greece, if I'm not mistaken, and Okinawa, I think, is the other other blue right. zone. Yep. As well. And then the last one is Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Yeah, that's right. That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. And they all have certain things in common, and they all have different reasons why. But yeah. if you put all everything that they do, and you take, like, oh, walking hills, you know, very social, and they have a sense of community, and they mm -hmm. take time to have a coffee with their friend, and they, they eat from their, you know, locally from their own gardens. Like, they take a little bit of everything they do. I think we can all create our own little blue zones and hopefully live a little bit longer you know, and healthier. Oh, it's funny. I don't, I don't want to get off the, the topic, which is running, but it is health in general that we're talking about. Right. And I just posted on, on my LinkedIn account, like the other day, like I talk to everybody. I don't care. Like, I don't care. Who they are. I don't care what they do for a living. Like, I just want to talk to people because I find their stories so interesting. And it's real life. It's not behind this digitized screen, right? It's not, uh, you're not scrolling. Right. You're just talking right. to people and you get to lo know about them. Like the local barista at the coffee shop, dude is awesome. Like at this point I walk in there, I don't have to order. He's like, hey, I got you set up already, you know? Right, right. There's something in great. human connection that allows us to live that healthier life. And I'm sure you probably tap into that a little bit throughout your conversations because you are looking at more of a holistic lifestyle in your right. practice that you are just hey make sure you eat right and sleep enough is right. that a good right. question yeah absolutely and i think people don't um understand the impact of our social network and our community that it has on us you know i think you know i'm fortunate to be in, in you know a first world nation in a pretty cool town and a you know i i have that built in and um i think i took it for granted for many years but um now that I know how important it is, I'm, we're trying to foster that. And the same thing, like I love going to a, a coffee shop and knowing the barista's name or yeah. going to, you know, going to the market and knowing the cashier's name and knowing, you know, wh what they went to school for and, and just having that conversation. Yeah, just following up with them, right? The next time you show you go in there and you're, 
So, for example, he told us he was taking his team to a baseball game because they've been stressed out and overworked and everything else. And so the next time we go there, it's going to be like, hey, how was the game? Right. right? How, did your, how did your team do at the game? Did you guys have fun and stuff like that? And it just perpetuates this feeling to your sense, to your word, uh, Michael, of community. Right. Right. A sense of belonging in there, um, which does lead me to my next next question, because I'm, I'm – a handful of months away from that master's category, if I'm not already there, depending on the event that I'm participating in. Are you helping and working with more people in, that are ed- aging in that master's category? Or are you still, or are you working with people that are at the high school level? Like, where do you see the separation in your business? Oh, wow. Um, yes to all of that. <laughs> um, you know, there's everything in between. You know, when I was in the clinic treating, so I don't, treat the injuries anymore but when i was in the clinic treating i would literally have you know like the the top eighth grader in the state who is what 12 13 years old i'm um, cross-country runner to an 85 year old waiting to compete in the next um senior olympics when it comes out and you know everything in between so you know fortunately we're all living longer i forgot what the numbers are what was it like by 2000 2050, we're going to have 2.1 billion people over the age of 60 in this country. In this country? Wait, wait. No, I think in the world. See, don't, oh. don't quote me. So let me say something. I'm not great with stats and remembering numbers. So anyone listening, <laughs> don't, don't harp on me. By me. <laughs> but put it, pretty much it's going to more than double whatever it is now by 2050. Because you know, people are living longer and people are staying pretty damn healthy. I mean, yeah. if you guys show up at races, there's 50 year olds and sometimes even older, not just podium, hitting the podium for their age group, but have you guys ever heard of the local race around here, the Anchor Down um, 100? No, no. Yeah. Anchor Down Ultra, it's called. It's a 24 hour race here in Rhode Island. And it's basically, you got 24 hours, you do, a, I think it's a two and a half mile loop in a beautiful town here, Bristol, Rhode Island. Right up um, alley at Ohm. What's that? That's right up Ohm's alley, running around. <laughs> Running around the loop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the guy who just won this year is 53 years old, and he's won six out of the last seven years. And there I... were guys in their 20s there, and this guy was a machine. He did, I think at his best, he did like 129 miles in 24 hours. This <laughs> year at 53, he did 120 miles, and that wasn't his lowest. I mean, he has come down. I think his, his best might have been his first or second year which was seven years ago but that dude is maintaining some serious fitness i think he's a unicorn because not many people his age can do that but you know people are doing pretty amazing things later on in life which is awesome but the problem is sometimes biology or you know genetics might not be all in uh what's the word i'm looking for all coordinated in working together so there might be some reasons why they're going to have more difficulty so um, i'm hoping to help them be able to stay healthy, respond well to their training, resist injury, and not just injury, but illness, you know. Think about the signs of overtraining, people getting sick. It's not just physical injury. Yeah, I don't, like, the the idea that this gentleman's running 120 to 130 miles at the age of 53 um, would beg the question, when did he start, right? right? Like, when did he start with his physical fitness and being able to build to that level? And it would lead leads me to the question of, is it too late to get started, right? So if you're 53 years old today and you haven't done anything, what advice would you give to that person today? Um, it's not too late. And depending on what their fitness and athletic history is, there might be a different approach to it. So for example, let's say we've got a 53-year-old overweight accountant who, you know, has been running his own business and has been sitting in front of a computer for 35 years and has never exercised. All right, we really got to take out the kid gloves and have a really slow and methodical approach to slowly increase his resiliency of his tissues because his tissues are not going to be resilient. He's not going to have the strength, the pliability, the flexibility, the stability, the mobility that he might need to do a 5K, never mind an ultra, versus someone who might have been a collegiate athlete. Um, and, you know, they did, you know, um, you know, over 20 leagues, over 30 leagues, but just took some time off and now. They've got some sort of athletic background and now just want to kind of focus on on running or triathlons. They might have a little easier time building into a good training program. So I can't give a one a one uh, one stop shop approach to that. But it all goes back to the history, um, which is, you know, why sometimes going on to Google, oh, yeah, couch to 5K, right? 
and that's pretty harmless because couch to 5k is not that complicated versus you know okay couch to 5k to an overweight diabetic who's never exercised before and is 58 years old all right now now it's a little more complicated so getting sound advice from a, pro a professional is always um better than searching through the 305 million hits on Google to figure out which one of those is going to be good advice for you. Yeah, I mean, we see it all the time. The, the you know, Steve129874.3, you know, on, on Twitter, on Instagram, espousing all of this advice. So how, how would a person who doesn't know, right, a person who does go to Google and gets 305 million results determine whether or not, you know, that account is somebody worth their time versus hey my run strong and michael silva this guy's been doing this for 20 years he's and he's got the credentials like how do you figure that out i mean hopefully there's a bio on there somewhere so you can see the history of the the person who's disseminating the uh the information because there is a lot of good information out there and there are a lot of really smart people much smarter than i am and much more experienced than i am that are out there but i think you know i He's saying this, but sometimes in social media, so if you look good in a tank top and you can do a cool dance while you're giving information, you'll you'll get more hits. So you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll get the you know you'll get the people following you, and you'll you know you'll sell more classes, you'll sell more programs, that type of thing. Where you got some ugly old guy like me who's just telling you how to do it, they might not want to listen. Um, it, it's so hard, you know. I think you just got to um, look at the history, try to look at even the testimonials aren't always great because a lot of those are um artificially um constructed right but i would try to have a, one, a personal conversation with someone if someone's looking to work with like a, a health coach on the other side of the country or the other side of the world at least sit down have a, have some good questions lined up about what their history is have they worked with someone like you with what your background is and what your goals are and just make sure and you know you know you know that the term like you get a gut feeling like our guts are second brain something just doesn't seem right when you like interviewing a coach then you might want to keep looking if it feels good you know if it looks like chicken it tastes like chicken it's chicken go for it <laughs> just put pineapple on it <laughs> uh, one of the one of the things that that actually brings up for me is something that jason and i talk about a lot which is like uh delayed gratification versus instant gratification um, which is just, you know, you open up social media, you get a dopamine hit, like all these influencers and these people, whatever their credentials are talking about, like life hacks. Um, right. So as somebody who's been, yeah, exactly, Jason, um, <laughs> as somebody who's oh, been doing I've... this as long as you have and knowing the process it takes for that, knowing that there's been more growth in that like instant gratification kind of like mindset uh how do you how do you navigate that um uh, how do you navigate that and let people know that this is all kind of a process like what how does michael silva approach that by doing things like this you know getting in front of groups of motivated people and like-minded individuals that we can collaborate and get the information out there because it's hard you know and i'm not a huge fan of social media i've got a 20 and a 16 year old at home and i spent many years trying to you know, pull them off of it because, you know, there's a lot of bad and addictive parts to it. And I've actually been trying to do more lately as I'm switching my career from being a hands-on, you know, clinic-based physical therapist to now trying to reach a lot of what I'm doing is virtually. So I'm working with runners and coaches in California and I'm here in Rhode Island. So I'm trying to do more of it. But again, I don't know if I'm getting the views. I don't have the patience or the biceps that might, might be needed in order to get the views and the likes and that type of thing. But um, I, I, I'm trying to do it old school. So these conferences, I'm going to collaborations like this. Like I was at a local university two weekends ago, um, talking to their whole track and field across country team. I'll be at another university in Massachusetts tomorrow doing the same type of talk, getting out to conferences, you know, just trying to get, let people know who, who I am and just have a conversation. I think this is great because it's a conversation and hopefully people are getting something out of it versus me just spitting out a, you know, a seven second, hey, light pack, <laughs> do this. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you how much that bugs me when I see the whole thing with like life hacks, like do this one thing and you'll be like incredible and shave like <laughs> seconds off your 100 mile PR or something like that. So it's funny you mentioned that because there's a, a screenshot I took um, and I blocked out the person's face, but it's a, a thumbnail for a YouTube video. 
it's a seven minute video and says of um never get hurt again or for running injuries i forget the exact title but it's pretty much it's like you a runner watch this seven minute video and you will never ever get hurt again seven and i'll bring minutes. it up yeah that's all you need i'm like shit i've wasted three and 25 years of my career all i have to do is watch a seven minute freaking video and i could i could help all these people so i'm just giving them all the video no that's not what i do but but that's the problem but it's quick and that's what people want you know three tips to never get shin splints ever again right i'm sorry if i'm not supposed to swear but that's bullshit like you can't there's no way you can do that because you because yeah. you, you know you might have shin splints because you have flat feet you might have shin splints because you have a super high arch i might have shin splints because my ass is weak like there's a million different reasons why you can get shin splints, and you're going to tell these people that all you have to do is these three exercises and you'll be shin splint free. Drives me crazy if you can't tell, but my energy just went up a little bit. And I don't know how to solve this problem. So I'm, you know? I'm with you, not necessarily on the physical fitness part of it all. I've been doing this stuff for 17, going on 17 years, too. And so I could have all the conversations in the world with anybody who's a conversation about it. I did it. Right. Right? That's it. But the, the one thing similar to that is I've been doing marketing for 30 years and all I see are these marketing bros, right? And it's like, you could have a seven income, a uh, seven figure income, but just by watching this 18 second video. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right. Like I've been doing it for 30 years. I could have saved myself all that time and been retired by now. You're wasting like it does your work. time. <laughs> it just, I know. just doesn't work that way. I know. I, my my free advice to you and for marketing your business keep doing it the way you're doing it Thank like you. i'm really going to be moderating a panel on october 10th about email marketing and one of the conversations i was talking to the the people today that are going to be on the panel is like social media is really really good but it's not the end all be all for marketing right it is a nice to have because you're leasing the audience if right. if Mark Zuckerberg decided today that he was going to change the algorithm, but just by putting a period in or a semicolon in or something, everything changes and the audience ad no longer exists. But if you have a good website with good SEO and you have uh, your own email marketing list, that is an owned audience. Right. Not only owned, but is they have expressed interest in your product. Right. So they're most likely to buy it. That's gold. Right? That's gold. So just keep sending the message right, right. to those people. Start with those two components, do your speeches, do your presentations, absolutely, because guess what happens there? Those people sign up for you immediately, right? They're like, oh, Michael Silva, I need to get on his email list because you're probably talking about it. And that email list grows and you keep sending out that information and you keep hammering away at your message. That is golden. Right. That is absolutely 100% golden. So just keep doing that part. And the, the people that are doing the hacks and the tricks for not just faster mile or how to build a seven figure business the work is two three four times more right because the moment the hack fails do these three things for to avoid shin splints and in three weeks the shin splints don't go away now i had to go do something else not only that, just wait it just wasted three yeah. weeks not only that but my hip now hurts too <laughs> because it's, it's two issues, right, right? I, know. I know like you must and this is go ahead I was gonna say you must see that all the time like a person is like well i started out with a shin splint issue and now my hip hurts but my back is giving me fits right well, it happens all the time because they try to you know ignore it you know like every good athlete they'll ignore it or they run through it and no pain no gain type of scenario i've got this diagram maybe i'll share it with you guys but it's this whole wheel it's the the running injury cycle and it's like okay you train you know, you're training a little harder. You do your first race, it goes well. So you train even harder. You're really pumped up. You do your second race, goes even better. Freaking training, double sessions, like really getting into it. And then you, your race doesn't go well. And then you get a little bit of pain. And then you you ignore it, like every good runner should, right? Then you start speed. <laughs> then you start speed. You start speed limping, so you can't even like. Now it's obvious you're hurt. So you go to Google and you waste your time there. Then you go see the doctor, which is a waste of time. Like everyone thinks they need to go to their primary care physician first. So what's he going to do? He doesn't know how to treat a running injury. So then he sends you to an orthopedic. You don't need surgery for a running injury. You don't. So now you just wasted two weeks to get into your doctor, another two weeks to get into your pro, to your sports medicine. Now they're going to say, go see a physical therapist. They need to wait two weeks to get in there. By that point, you missed your event. The season's over. And then you, you and they're going to tell you, just stop running, take Advil, ice it, which is not going to really solve the problem. It's just going to, you know, ease the pain. And then they repeat the whole freaking cycle over again. And it goes, so my whole career, I've tried to like 
break that cycle and jump in there as soon as possible. And you guys may know this, but hopefully some of your listeners, um, most of your listeners should know this, but in the healthcare system, which is a very frustrating system, you can go directly to a physical therapist. I think it's, it must be in all 50 states now, but insurance, most insurances will pay for you to go right to a physical therapist because running injuries, there's maybe 0.01% of running injuries need surgery. What they need is like correct to try to find out where the problem's coming from, get the corrective strategy in there, ease the, the stress on that tissue to allow it to heal, correct the imbalances. They don't need a surgeon. They don't need a primary care physician. So just go right to either you know, a clinician, a chiropractor, or a sports medicine PT. Again, again, I get excited about this type of thing too, because we waste so much money and time in our healthcare system, which is kind of why I pulled out and I'm trying to help people outside of it and help them navigate it a little bit better. The Physio 360 PT actually just confirmed it is all 50 states. And that's a good PT right there. I know him. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Josh. <laughs> thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. So, Michael, uh, before we jump into our what we call our rapid fire questions, um, if I had to ask you, not that if, if I have to ask you, but I'm going to ask you. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> most people most advice. I want you to give two pieces of advice to people who are thinking about getting started in running and endurance sports in general, because they might be cycling and they might be swimming. What okay. two advice should they move forward from a P only two? Yeah, only two. You got to limit it. Man. <laughs> All right. One, do not neglect your rest and recovery. Get a good night's sleep take days off. I don't care what coach you work with. No one, especially a recreational adult, should be training seven days a week. I just don't feel that's ever needed. Um, so rest and recovery, do not neglect it. It's the most powerful tool we have. It's free. You can control it. It's very easy. There's one. Number two, man, you're holding me to just two of them. I've got like 47. Um, <laughs> Um, find a good coach. Find a good coach who works with someone that fits your um, your persona. If you're a, a 58-year-old accountant that wants to raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and do a, a marathon for such a great cause, work with a coach. Work with someone who knows how to build and slowly add the, the training load into your body so you don't get hurt and you can actually build the resiliency. Don't try to do it on your own unless you are a coach, but um, get help. There's help out there. Interview a coach, work with someone that you can actually talk and have a conversation with that knows you, you know them. It'll be worth every penny you spend on them. And I'm not trying to sell it because I don't coach. So um, find a good one. I can give you guys referrals if you need it, but I'm sure you guys can. But I guess that would be my first two thoughts that come to mind. So the, on the first tip, Oma and I have joked often, and, and maybe we now finally have to do it, but talking about getting t-shirts that say you stay hard i'm going to take a nap because yes. rest free is super important right um right. and then the other one is i totally agree with you on on getting a coach i would highly recommend you interview them if right. the coach is willing to talk to you for 30 minutes about their philosophy about that about how they approach how they communicate how they work with people like you would athletes that they've worked with in the past they're not for you. It's just not going to be a good fit come hell or high water. You're going to be frustrated and you might end up having to go see somebody like Michael or physio 360 PT Josh, because <laughs> you felt hurt. Um, right. because it wasn't working with you. Um, right. so that's, those are two great pieces of advice. And honestly, people make sure you, you're heeding those, that advice and that warning rest and recover. Right. Super right. important. I'll throw Can I jump it. On? Can I jump on that coach thing really quick? Yeah. So there's a coach that, I, that used to be here in Rhode Island. He's out in Arizona now. He's awesome. I love him. And he's actually, I know, because I've worked with a lot of his athletes, like he'll talk to them about their stress and their sleep and their rest and actually modify their um, programs according to how they're feeling versus just, nope, we're supposed to do five miles at this pace today. you got to do it. But I didn't sleep last night. My dog died and I have diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> you really still want me to do right. it? Yeah, no. So you need to find someone that can, that's why you need to work with someone that knows you and you know them so they can adjust and modify because life doesn't come at us and organize sets and reps and days and, you know, life's hard, there's stress. Yeah. So you need to be able to 
accommodate for that. Well, life isn't compartmentalized. I, Maria Simone, who was my coach, and I coach under her umbrella at No Limits Endurance Coaching right now, taught me 10 years ago, 11 years ago, stress is stress. So whether it's your dog dying, right, which is a stressful component, or your physical activity of running five miles, that's stressful, regardless of where you're coming from. So you have to pay attention to it and be smart about it. You know, the other day I was like, I'm going to go run 10 miles. Uh, I'm training for this around the year or so whatever it's called, um, um, will correct me, um, event that's a one mile loop every 15 minutes. And it's a totally different mindset for me. And uh, the day before I ran two plus hours out on the trail and I was going to go to the path and run two plus hours, I woke up and I was exhausted. I was tired. I was like, this is point going out there is going to be pointless. It's going to stress my body out. It's going to give me an opportunity to get injured. And so I didn't do it. Sure enough, later that afternoon, this was on Sunday, I wound up taking a two hour nap. And I'm a 30 minute nap guy. I'm a 20 to 30 minute nap guy. I was asleep for two hours because clearly my body wasn't ready for it. So there was no pushing it. Right. Smart, I got smart decision, man. So yeah. Smart. I got better from resting than I would have from running. Would have just pushed that way further out. Right. Oh, um, what were you just saying to me before Michael jumped on the call about the Oregon 200 recovery process for you? Oh, man. man I'm just like off my feet. I'm just eating, resting, recovering, just doing walking. I mean, even like leading up to the race, um, I had done other races and I was constantly committing communicating with my coach like oh you know today today you know I did like one hour of the three hours it's supposed to do or like I cut my run short I was but I think most importantly I'm not afraid of I don't see recovery or rest or cutting workout short as the boogeyman I see it as like a necessity I think that people talk about training hard I think training hard also means recovering hard right. I think that big component of it um People see recovery. There's a stigma of like, like being lazy, being on the couch and everything. But I'm like, no, you have to recover. I, I I dare people to recover as strong as they train because if you train strong, you have to recover strong. Right, right. I joke around with some of the like the high school runners I work with over the years, and some of the programs are like seven day a week programs, which I don't get, especially for growing teenagers, growing pubescent bodies, like. That that's not what they need. And I would tell them, use me as an excuse. You like say like my therapist said I can't run, even though they were they were discharged. I'm like, you can always lie to your coach about me. <laughs> not that I want you to lie, but this is a nice white life for your health. You know, and I, and I and I tell the parents, I'm like, he's allowed to play video games all day on Sunday. Like just let him sit on the couch, let him watch a movie, let him Netflix, let him eat whatever. Just rest and like don't don't be up on your feet. because um, it's so important. And training training hard isn't training smart you know um training hard and resting hard is training smart Absolutely. i like that i've never used the term resting hard but i like that yeah, yeah i would always say train hard race harder rest hardest right oh. that's it all right all right michael thank you so much for your time and your expertise we're going to jump into our uh rapid fire questions <sighs> I will all revolve around food and so there's going to be some, some really good debate going on here. Um, and since did, you, did you guys know that food's my second best, my second favorite topic in the world? Good, because it is mine too. I love it. All right, all right, all right. Every Friday, I do a Food Fight Friday video, and it's just like, here's my hot food take, and let me hear yours. So right. uh, it's been awesome. But anyway, so here we go. Oreos, OG or double stuff? Neither. What? Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I gotta say this. I prefer the answer of neither versus the people keep talking about these Oreo thins, which is nothing more than a cracker or these uh, Oreo cakesters, which is nothing more than a ding dong. Like stop it with this uh, stuff. It's just an Oreo. If you gotta go Oreo, go OG. There you go. Licorice. Are you a licorice fan? No licorice at all. No. Red, red Twizzlers, red, yes. Red Twizzlers, yes. But yeah. black licorice, the, the amar I think it's amaranth, right? Yeah, yeah. Out, out completely. Out. Yeah. Oh, anise, not, not, not anise. amaranth. Candy corn. Is candy corn a real candy or is it just earwax coated in sugar? Earwax coated in sugar. Good answer. Peeps, 
is pizza real candy or is it just a marshmallow covered in dust? Marshmallow covered in yeah. dust. So here's the thing. We've been told more than once in this, this is our 72nd, 73rd episode. We've been told more than once that you should eat a peep stale. Like, first off, they're gross to begin with. Now you want me to eat it more gross? Why? What? Nah. Does it change when it gets stale? Is it like wine? Does it get better? No. It becomes a, a doorstop. <laughs> yeah, I'll sit with that. <laughs> Peanut butter, nut butter if you're allergic. Creamy or crunchy? Crunchy. Yes. Chocolate chip cookies or an oatmeal raisin cookie? Oatmeal raisin. Yes. Yeah. Grilled, Love oatmeal raisin cookies. Grilled cheese or peanut butter and jelly? Grilled cheese. Nah. Eh. Eh, sorry. <laughs> it only <laughs> Island and we're getting fallish temperatures. Say it again. Is it only because you're in Rhode Island and you're getting like fallish temperatures and you're thinking yeah, of tomato soup? It's comfort food. Tomato soup, grilled cheese. Yeah. See, I'm a savory guy more than a sweet guy. So all this candy corn pizza <laughs> makes me sick. Let's talk tacos, grilled cheese, we're getting... pizza. Let's talk about that. All right, yeah. all right, okay, go. So, so is red velvet cake an actual flavor or is it nothing more than chocolate cake in red food dye? I think it's chocolate cake and red food dye. Yeah, that's, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Um, ice cream. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream, and why is it chocolate chip mint? And why is it chocolate chip mint? <laughs> <laughs> it's not chocolate chip mint. It's black raspberry chip. But, uh, what? What is that? Yeah. I've never heard of this. Oh, black, is that a local? Yeah. Black raspberry ice cream with chocolate chips in it? No. Is that something you find locally? I guess so. So that was my dad's favorite ice cream. He turned me on to it when he was alive. And I've watched him eat it my whole life. And that's my favorite. And now my kids, that's their favorite as well. Interesting. That sounds good. Well, maybe you got to come to Rhode Island to try it, I guess. I don't know. It actually sounds refreshing with the raspberry component in there. Oh, it's really good. It's not a sherbet. It's ice cream. It's creamy. That's like the one sugary thing I'll go for. I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah. Candy bar. Favorite candy bar. Snickers. Snickers. Yeah. From a brownie's perspective, are you are you going nuts on the brownie or no nuts on the brownie? No nuts. All right. So now into the savory component. You have yeah. a you have a burrito wrapper in front of you. you what are you filling it up with? Okay. Um, chicken, rice, black beans, guacamole, cheese, onions, cilantro, jalapenos. Raw raw onions or cooked onions? Hmm. Both. How spicy is the guacamole? Spicy. On fire? Ooh. Oh, caliente. Yeah. <laughs> and then a the hot sauce on every bite? Every bite. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Love it. <laughs> Pancakes, waffles, or French toast for breakfast? French toast. Why? Because it's a little more savory and there's a little more protein to it. All right. Are you, so you said chicken, so you're a meat eater then? Yeah. Barbecue, Texas style, North Carolina style, St. Louis style, or maybe there's another style I don't know of. I didn't know there was all different styles. Oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm not. I'm Northeast, so like, we don't have a ton of like great barbecue up here. Yeah. Um, when I was in Austin, Texas, I had some serious barbecue there. So I guess that's the cut. Yeah. Is that, was that it, the option, yeah. Texas style? Yeah, it tends to be more wet because they mop it. That's what they call it. They mop it with the sauce. Um, they, sl they slap it silly with the sauce br the brush there. <laughs> the style tends to be more dry rub. And then North Carolina style is more of a vinegar-based uh, barbecue sauce. So See, it's a little tang. I think we should have a, a conference and <laughs> all of us should be there. And we should have a food tasting barbecue. We'll get some three really well-known restaurants to supply it, and then we can have a food tasting competition. I'm in. I, don't, I won't eat it, but I'll be happy to judge it. All right. <laughs> what, what's your go-to meal after a hard workout? Go-to meal after a hard workout. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. Don't to be honest, I'm not famished after a hard workout, so it'd probably be just a smoothie or a shake. So this, this is a really good question. It's not part of our deal, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and this will be the last one. So the topic came up of not being hungry after a hard workout, and some of the uh, answers have been, and I, and I will admit that I'm this way too, like 
years ago, I was probably taking 200 to 300 calories an hour while I was working out. And then after, after I finished working out, long run, long ride, I would be famished. I was like, I need to eat food. Right. Now I'm pushing close to 600 calories an hour between the liquids that I'm taking and whatever solid foods I'm eating at the same time. And when the run is over or the swim, bike or whatever is over, I don't feel that hungry. So do you think it's because of the number of calories that you're taking during the workout that by the time you're done, you're like, I still kind of feel full, but I know I need to recover. So smoothies will do me well. Um, I think for your, your example, most likely because you're taking enough caloric intake that you're not famished with me. I'm not working out as hard as you do anymore. <laughs> I'm a, so I don't, I don't take in calories during my workouts these days. Um, for me, I just think it's probably a, a central nervous system thing in my stomach. You know, I just don't feel like feeling it, especially if I feel really good and I had a good workout and I have, don't have a ton of joint pain and like I'm feeling all right. Um, yeah, I just don't want to take in much. So, you know, a good smoothie will, will satisfy me for a while. Well, let that be a lesson for everybody. Your body is your body. Your body is not Michael or Ohm's or my body. You got to pay attention to what's going on for yourself. Michael, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we let you go, where can people find you? How can they get in touch with you if they want to work with you? Sure. So uh, myrunstrong.com um, is my site where it talks about all the, um, the online and virtual courses and programs that I have. Um, I also, um, I don't know if you want to post it, but for all the viewers, um, we can, I'm giving um, two discounts. Um, I, don't, I don't know if we can post that somewhere. Um, you can let me know, Jason. All right. So for the, the two um, of my most powerful pro programs, the Run Strong 101, which is a five-phase strengthening program. It's normally a $79 program, giving $50 off for anyone who um, anyone who's viewing. So $29 for that, which is our my number one selling course. And then the, the running video analysis that I do, it's a virtual running video analysis. It's, it's been very, very valuable. Um, I did it in person for 15 years, and so now we're doing it virtually. That's normally a $299, and we're taking $50 off of that as well. Um, so also social media, My Run Strong, um, Facebook and Instagram, and my, Michael Silver on LinkedIn. Awesome. So Michael, thank you so much. We will put the coupon codes and everything in the notes section of the, of the post when we put it on Instagram Live right now. Awesome. You guys are great, and uh, thank you for having me, and hopefully uh, people had a good time listening to us talk about the weirdest conversation I've had all day. Awesome. <laughs> That's what we strive for. <laughs> right. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Michael. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.